Today, we're checking not one, but two national parks off our list. This is beautiful. This is the part where you start to watch your head. Come along as we explore New Mexico's underground at Carlsbad Caverns, and then venture high above Texas at Guadalupe Mountains. We're Howard and Caitlin New State. This year, we're traveling to 51 parks in 52 weeks. We're visiting all the U.S. national parks in the lower 48 in a special Winnebago Vista limited edition. Each week, we're sharing where to stay, what to do, and introducing you to the people doing incredible work across our national parks. These neighboring national parks are only about 40 miles from each other, making this the perfect combination stop. First up, we're taking you to Carlsbad Caverns. The main attraction here is, of course, the caverns, comprised of 120 known caves. Can you believe they are still exploring and discovering more? Carlsbad Caverns has been a national park since 1930, and one year later, they blasted the first ever elevator shaft to allow future visitors easier access. Carlsbad Caverns also earned special recognition as a designated UNESCO World Heritage Site because of the amazing size and abundance of the rock formations found here. There's only one entrance to the park, which sees on average half a million visitors each year. There are no camping accommodations inside the park, but we stayed at a free BLM campground about 20 minutes away. Sunset Reef is first come first served dry camping with fire pits and picnic tables. The nearby city of Carlsbad as well as White City all have private campgrounds and great dining options too. We're doing our first stop here, we're at Carlsbad Caverns. Yes. We have never been before, we're very excited. All told this is about a mile and a half. And we're right now hiking to the natural entrance. Your other option is just to take the elevator down. Uh, but we're going to be taking the elevator back up. Yeah, I mean, we're going to do the easy part down. <laughs> Work smarter, not harder, is what I always say. So they are doing timed reservations right now. So you have to book a time slot. We booked the 1030 window, and you have 60 minutes to enter any time during that window. And then you get to go down, and you can spend as much time in the cave as you want to. Okay, so here we go. We are about to descend 750 feet. That is 75 stories straight down <laughs> into the cave. I'm about to take our sunglasses off because you're not going to need those inside. <laughs> it's dark. The air temperature has already dropped a lot. Like it's getting chilly enough. I'm about to put on like a hoodie. The temperature has already dropped a lot. <laughs> like I said, it's cold. Um, did the, I did, <laughs> the, the outside temperature is about 80 degrees right now and I would say it's at least 10 or 15 degrees cooler and we're not even actually inside the mouth of the cave yet. I'm really sad because I thought we just saw like 15 bats and they're swallows. Imposter bats. It's still cool. <laughs> I'm gonna pretend that they're bats in my mind. Okay, this is the part where you start to watch your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. We're actually getting now into the game. Oh, starting to see some formations. <laughs> this is so cool. We're whispering because sound really carries in the cave. So if we talk at a normal volume, everybody, and I mean everybody, <laughs> will be able to hear us. <laughs> Which is usually not a problem for us because I'm kind of loud. This is so beautiful, all the different formations and hearing the dripping water, it's just so cool. This is like the inception of caves, being in a cave, inside of a cave. It's kind of hard to believe, but we're not even halfway. I thought it was only a mile and a half. It's actually uh, another hour to an hour and a half to go through the whole big room, but there's a shortcut. Don't you love when they have one of those? So we're gonna go halfway, circle back, and then we're gonna take the elevator back up because why not? There's so many stalactites and stalagmites. Do you know the difference, Howard? Uh, one hangs and then one points up. Stalactites hold on tight. So they hang down and stalagmites rise because they're mighty. I learned that in elementary school. All right, I made it to the shortcut. Half a mile, right? Then see the big room and then to the elevator. The big room is definitely the most popular thing to see and do here at the park. It's the largest single cave chamber by volume in North America, and given the paved trails and elevator, it's also one of the most easily accessible. As we mentioned, there are over 100 limestone caves found here at Carlsbad Caverns. Some are only accessible by ranger-guided hikes or require a permit if you have caving experience. In our opinion, this is a great national park if you only have a few hours to explore. We have re-emerged into the daylight. 
Yeah, there must have been some kind of mistake uh, <laughs> because that was definitely Carl's good cavern. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Howard's not even saving a really bad or good dad joke. <laughs> yeah, that was Carl's good cavern. It was really good. Oh, you're so funny. Yeah. It really was amazing. Like, it's a fantastic spectacle of just stalagmites and stalactites, and it's incredible. All right, to reward ourselves after hiking down into the caverns, we came to the Cactus Cafe, which is like right outside of the park in White City. And if you're a burger lover like me, all your burger dreams will come true. I had a buffalo truffle burger that was amazing with truffle fries. It was so good. And Howard, you had the spicy mother clucker. <laughs> that was it awesome. wasn't, I mean, it wasn't quite such a rogue name. It was yeah, a spicy right? clucker. Oh. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Kaylin's getting, <laughs> Kaylin's getting spicy herself with her language. <laughs> spicy clucker. Okay, it was good though. <laughs> it was really good. Yeah, it was delicious. It was a grilled chicken. Uh, I had uh, fresh guacamole, fried jalapeno, a cheese. It had bacon on it. It was really good. We're very full now. Yeah. It was time to head just down the road across state lines into Texas for our next national park, Guadalupe Mountains. This is another relatively compact park, but it does offer both tent and RV camping available by reservation on recreation.gov. I think this is one of the coolest and most unique campgrounds we've come across inside a national park. Some people might say, well, it's just a parking lot, but there are a lot of positives to it. For example, you have incredible views of the mountains. You're parked at two of the most popular trailheads in the park, so you can get on the trail nice and early, and you're only 90 seconds from the visitor center. This park is sometimes overlooked, but given its close proximity to El Paso and Carlsbad, they do see a lot of weekend visitors. In 2021, they hit record attendance numbers with 243,000 visitors. So the secret is starting to get out that Guadalupe Mountains has great hiking, history, and even camping. All right, we made our stop at the visitor center, got our park map and the lay of the land, as well as our stamp, our sticker, and our magnet. And they also happened to be doing a great ranger talk, and we learned all about how this area used to be completely underwater, and there were sharks living here. My name is Justin, and I've been a ranger here at Guadalupe Mountains since uh, September of last year. Uh, before that, I worked at Carlsbad Caverns, so I've gotten to know the Guadalupe Mountains pretty well. Now, I mentioned my program was about sharks, and you might have been asking yourself, why am I talking about sharks in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert? But the answer is right behind me here. Guadalupe Mountains are actually the largest and best preserved Permian fossil reef on the planet. Most of the land mass of the world is fused into one big continent. We give that a term you might have heard before, Pangaea. Pangaea literally means all land, and so all land fused into one. And then correspondingly, we had one great ocean that covered the rest of the world. And we call the ocean Panthalassa, meaning all ocean. And because of this, animals, plants, sea creatures were able to move from one end of the earth to the other fairly easily. And so a lot of the same species, a lot of the same fossils you find in Siberia, South Africa, and here. So this would have been a tropical environment back then. Here is a little sample of what the ocean floor would have looked like at that coral reef area. You'll see lots of different fossils there and just a little bit of a glimpse of the enormous amount of biodiversity we had here at the Capitan Reef during the Middle Permian. Now the first shark I want to talk about today is an animal called Stethacanthus. So I've got one of those rare complete fossils here and then an artist's reconstruction of what they thought Stethacanthus might look like. What jumps out at you about Stethacanthus? The top fin, yeah, this unusual feature there. And one thing you can notice about this fin is if you look very closely at the bones, you'll notice it actually has a joint. So this is a fossil, a replica rather, but a fossil that was actually found right here in Guadalupe Mountains National Park. Let's start passing this around. Tell me what jumps out at you about this fossil. Yeah, it's kind of spiky patterns along the edge. Uh, a lot of people I've heard liken it to, it kind of looks like the sun, or a you know, cartoon drawing of it. But if you look a little closer, you'll notice that there's a second segment kind of nested inside of it. And in fact, when we find complete versions of this fossil, we find a disc with a spiral down towards the center. Don't worry, it took paleontologists about 120 years to really nail this down. <laughs> now this unusual feature is actually a way to apply uneven pressure to ammonite shells. It's basically like a big nutcracker if you want to think of it that way. 
a way to get at all the food that was available in the Permian Sea. And this feature would have sat in the lower jaw. And we do have a catchy nickname for Helicoprion as well. We call this the Buzzsaw Shark. And so as you go through Guadalupe Mountains National Park, uh, look for fossils, look around in the rocks all over. You'll find little traces of this Permian world and little traces of the world before one of the largest mass extinctions in Earth's history. We're at for Holy Ranch, and Howard is using the Handy Dandy National Park Service app. It is completely free. I think they just launched it this year or late last year, and we've talked about it before in several of our other videos. It is an excellent resource because you can save everything offline that you need for the park, and you can even use it for navigation. So it is a great tool that we would highly recommend utilizing. Did you find what we're gonna do? Yes, we are going to the Frijole Ranch Museum and then we're going to the Manzanita Springs. This portion of the trail is paved. If you continue on to another set of springs, it goes to a dirt path uh, that takes about two to three hours. This is 0.6 miles, so anybody can do it. Let's check it out. We're inside the main house now, which today is used as a museum, and it gives you an excellent overview through the years of the Native Americans and several families who called this home and how they used the land and the springs. And it was the Smith family who actually used the springs to their full potential. The Smiths used the spring, which is still flowing outside today, in a number of ways. They developed an irrigation system and methods to gravity feed water into the house. They planted a very successful orchard here, as well as built a post office and school house for their children and others from neighboring ranches. The Smiths sold the property in the 1940s, but today the Park Service helps maintain the important history that has happened over centuries on this plot of land. It is always so cool to me when you find a water source in the desert where it's pretty barren and dry, and then all of a sudden around the water are all of these big trees, it's lush and it's green, and that's obviously what drove people here because where there is water, there is life. There's fish in there. What? The water in the spring is so clear. You can see straight down to the bottom. And it's supporting all these birds and fish. This is beautiful. When you come out to Manzanita Spring, just stand here for like five minutes and you'll start to see some really incredible things. For example, I have never seen dragonflies that are this color. They are a vibrant burnt orange and there are a bunch of them just flying around. And then Howard mentioned the fish and then we're seeing all of these birds do these like drive-by drinks of water. It is so cool. We're on a scenic drive on Highway 62, which is also Highway 180, and there are several viewpoints that you can pull off. You can see the Guadalupe Peak, El Capitan, and then we're eventually gonna be heading to some sand dunes. What you doing? <laughs> I'm up here on this little platform. I mean, technically it's just some steps to get up and over because there's a little trail you can walk out, but this is also a great spot to come up and snap a few photos. And it is so beautiful. All right, ready? Next stop. We're on another one of those grand adventures, taking the CRV to the limits. <laughs> we are heading out to the Salt Basin dunes and most of the road was fine, but the last like two miles gets very rough. So don't try to do this in a low clearance vehicle like a car. You at least need a small SUV in order to get over some of the potholes and rocks and things like that. But the mountains from this angle are absolutely beautiful. Whew. How are you doing there? That was a drive. But the CRV can do it. <laughs> All right, so now we're at this parking area. Maybe it looks like they have a little hike. I got this extra gallon of water here. This is definitely a place where you want to make sure you have plenty of water. It is early May right now and temperatures right now, since we came off the mountain, we're at a little bit lower of elevation. It's already 92 degrees out. So just make sure you have enough water, you have a hat, you have sunscreen, all of that good stuff to protect yourself. Try not to spill it on your car seat. <laughs> Do it outside, kid. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Didn't spill a drop. 
The other good thing about this area is that there are pit toilets here. Because we are so far away from the visitor center and the other sections of Guadalupe Mountains National Park, you might need a little rest stop. So just know that they are here. So this is where we drove from, right here. We came all the way around, you can't see that part of the map, and way over here and then cut across. So it does take about an hour to get out here. So again, just make sure you budget enough time and have the proper vehicle that can do it. You can learn a lot from those signs. So we have learned that they do not allow sledding at these dunes, unlike some of the other dunes we've been to. And that's because the plant life that grows on these dunes is actually helping to protect them. Unlike Death Valley, where the surrounding mountains help to form them and keep them in place, there's only a mountain range behind them. So that's why there's no sledding allowed. And the other thing is it's really, really, really important to stay on trail here in the desert. There's a cryptobiotic crust that is crucial to all of the plant life here in the desert and if you step on that, it can do severe damage. So just make sure you stay on the trail. The other thing is that there is an overlook, so you don't have to go the full mile out to the dune entrance. On a super hot day like today, I think that's just what we're gonna go do is the overlook and get a nice view of the dunes. See the black right there? That's the crust right there. That's the crust. Don't stand on that. These look very different. Yeah. They're definitely not as tall. The sign said, I think the tallest one is 60 feet, um, which is yeah, pretty tall, but from a distance, they look very different. You can see a lot more green on the dunes, talking about that plant life that lives there. Yeah, you can kind of see them out there. Yeah. I do think that the drive out here is worth it to see this side of the mountain range. It's so beautiful and it really does give you a different perspective and I feel like over here we can see more of those layers and it's just so fascinating to think about how much this land has changed and the fact that this was like a reef and underwater. What's that? There's four trailheads right here that leave from the parking lot adjacent to the campground. So we are heading to the Devil's Hall Trail, which looks incredible from the photos. I'm very excited. Uh, 4.2 miles round trip. Let's go. Since there are four trails here, kind of going in all different directions, this is reminding me of Pinnacles you have to pay attention to the signs. So in this case, Devil's Hall is that way. Okay, we made it about halfway, and I'm very glad that we waited until later in the day to do this, so I would recommend either early in the morning or later in the day, because there's not much shade on that trail, and if the sun was blazing down, it would be much hotter and much harder. So that is my hot tip for this trail. Right. Hot tip, I get it. <laughs> Onward. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> was this way, right? Yeah. Also, you definitely want hiking boots. No tennis shoes. The difficulty level just went up about five notches. Look down there. So we gotta climb down. All right, we'll get to it, come on. I was, I was assessing the situation. <laughs> you wanna have a plan. The last half mile has been incredibly challenging. Again, you need very sturdy boots, uh, lots of ankle support. We are climbing over boulders in a wash, and sometimes it's really hard to determine where exactly the trail is. I think we're still following it, so far so good. It is beautiful, I'm still very glad that we did it, but just beware there's a lot of scrambling going on. How you doing there, Kaylin? <laughs> yeah, this is tough, it's a hard one. It's labeled as strenuous, so I knew this was coming. But I think part of the major challenge, Howard brought up a really good point while we were hiking, they don't have the cairns, um, which are like the rock stacks that kind of indicate their trail markers, the trailblazers. And that would really help on this trail. Yes, it would. Yeah. We made it, Kaylin. The name of this one sounds like it should be in Death Valley, Devil's Hall. I can see why it's called that. Yeah. Look, well, you got the striation in the mm -hmm. rocks. Yeah, see all those layers? It's so cool. Yeah. All right, let's see what's around the bend. Oh, I think it's gonna be good. I can get up there. Holy smokes. It's beautiful. You know what those are? I think they're claw marks. You know what 
what that means? What? Godzilla. <laughs> it does look like something. Or a Sasquatch some point, like... or something. Look, look, look at these. You tell us. I mean, what do you think? Look Looks at that. Like this maybe okay, this is my hypothesis. At some point this was filled with water and all these rocks weren't here, and maybe some animal got trapped down here and was trying to get out and couldn't. A woolly mammoth? No, oh, like a raccoon. A raccoon did that. Yeah, but I don't think so. This one's big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That looks like Wolverine from the <laughs> X-Men. How do we get up there? Yeah, because if you look on the, come up to you. If you look at the National Park Service app, because we have no cell service here, but we can see where we are on the map. It still goes for quite a ways, but I'm not really sure how to safely do so? Yeah. So we might stop here. We might. I mean, that kind of looks a little sketchy there. Yeah. And maybe it goes up and over? A lot of flies. Holy smokes. That's so many flies. We have found the hole. The answer was to come up and over, and then you can see the little watering hole, and you can continue on if you want. Uh, it is about seven o'clock, so we're gonna head back because we have that big scramble to get through and then get back to the RV. But this was really cool, very beautiful. Just know what you're getting into before you do it. <sighs> we made it. It is. 7.56 p.m. So that took us about two and a half hours and we didn't go the entire length of Devil's Hall. So it was a good amount of time. It was beautiful coming back down because the sky turned like these bright pinks and blues and oranges. So sunset was really beautiful. And the best part is that our RV is parked right there. I can see it. We're gonna have some dinner and go to bed. <laughs> Coming up on our National Park series, get ready for Utah's Mighty Five. That's right, over the next few weeks, we're taking you to Zion, Bryce Canyon, Capitol Reef, Arches, and Canyonlands. Come along as we hike, ride, eat, and sightsee our way through these bucket list national parks. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you soon.